YouTube. This is YouTube. Yeah, we're going to try this. We've been uh, doing some experimenting to find out if this is going to work. So fingers crossed. Um, my name is Dr. John Edwards from Mama's Chiropractic. This is our Sexy Brains Talk. It's one of my favorite talks to give, and I want to tell you why. So really quickly, understanding the difference between the sexes, male and female brains, helps us not only understand our partners, but can help us understand our children. It can also help us understand ourselves in times of stress. And when I'm going to talk about the, the term sex, what I'm talking about is the biological difference, uh, you know, chromosomally within your DNA. There's gender, which is identity, but then there's also this, this term of sex that we're going to talk about. And the reason that this is important to, to define is because from the time that we're these little, uh, you know, multicellular organisms getting together and the surge of testosterone happens, something really funny happens to the brain. Um, so we are built on a female template every single human being, which is the reason why males have nipples. If you ever wondered why you're looking down guys, you're like, why do I have nipples? This is why these useless nipples are there is because you're actually built on the same DNA template as every single female in your family. The, um, the search of testosterone hits and that's where the big difference happens in your brain. And from that point in time, something really interesting happens to the neurons inside your brain. Instead of sitting on the inside in there doing all these connections, what happens is they leave your brain. Yes, I did say that correctly, that males have neurons that just leave their brain. They just go away, right? But they don't just go away to, to, to go outside of, their, uh, outside of their head, outside of their bodies. They go into their bodies to really make up the physical difference that you're going to see. Something we would call morphology, what the body looks like. That is like the physical difference between males and females. So from that very, very like simple difference between men having all these neurons, they leave the brain to go out to the body, female brains do something completely different with all those neurons. They make a whole bunch more connections. Females are wired for connection. From the time that they're you know, in that template and in that, in that little inner uterine space somewhere along the amniotic fluid, they're sitting there wiring all those neurons together. Um, it's why women are smarter than guys are. Absolutely, uh, it has a lot to do with this. It has a lot to do with their, their ability to, to think and multitask. Uh, it has a lot with their ability to, to read and, and react emotionally to things in ways that the male brains really aren't hardwired to do. And so understanding these kinds of things about our brains can really help us out in a lot of instances. Um, the, uh, the, I wanna talk a little bit about the differences when we talk brain, there's also a, a kind of an easy way to understand the right side of your brain and the left side of your brain. And this is also really important as we start understanding ourselves. We typically, in just kind of just as we're talking as common people, we'll talk about right brain people being the artistic kinds of people. They're the ones that are super, they're creative or they play music. Um, they're the ones that, uh, you know, do a lot of watercolors, you know, maybe they, they, they come up with really interesting Pinterest boards. Um, the left brain people are going to be more of your analytical folks. Your analytical people are going to be really good at Sudokus. Like, I swear that my stepmom has gone through so many Sudoku puzzles, crossword puzzles. She's always done that my entire life. Um, she worked as a technical writer uh, for a long time, helping to do manuals and understand that kind of stuff. People who like doing math and get attracted to science tend to be more left brain kinds of people. Um, now, I use this right and left brain stuff, understanding that a lot of the research in neurology right now is getting away from that terminology. They start talking more in terms of dominance and non-dominant sides. But for the purposes of what we're gonna be talking about today, right and left brain is gonna work really well. Um, I get the opportunity to teach this to uh, other chiropractors around the world. Um, and what we're gonna be discussing today is a little bit of that, that snippet that I do for the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association. When we start talking about the differences between right side and left side, the difference between male and female brains, the reason it becomes important is because it helps us understand our own brains um, when it comes time for how to tell if they're functioning well or not. Um, the right side of your brain has a lot to do with, uh, I'm gonna use three words here, joy, contentment, and happiness. Now, for the longest time in my life, I always took all three of those as meaning the same thing. That I thought joy and contentment and happiness we're all pretty equivalent. But the interesting thing about those three is that there's a time difference between joy and contentment and happiness. And I wanna give you a quick example. So I have a nice little glass of kombucha that my friend Allison got for me here. It's, uh, it's delicious, thank you very much for picking this one out. So this made me happy. Um, when I was coming here tonight, I was thinking, boy, I can't wait to eat that kombucha. This is gonna be great. 
Now, when I, when I finish my kombucha, I, uh, I, I'm no longer gonna have kombucha. And so, what am I gonna do without the booch? Where's my happiness gonna go? Thank goodness, right? Bye bye, it's gonna go away. Because it's a short term thing. There's a time difference between joy and contentment and happiness. Happiness is a temporary phase, it's a temporary state. We can have something and that can make us happy, which is important for the brain, but that part of our perception lives on the left side of your brain. It stays in present tense, it's right here, right now. Now, joy, contentment, is something that you refill on a regular basis. Like so, sunshine. Like sunshine. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like sunshine and rain. Good, yeah. Well, like affirmations. Like being able to, on a regular basis, have, have your sweetheart send you a message that says, oh man, you know what? You're gonna rock this day. Those people are gonna be so, like, in, in, just completely entranced by the stuff you're gonna talk about. It's gonna change their lives. They're really good at this, right? And if you get this kind of stuff on a regular basis, wow, that really starts filling up. If you can start saying, oh, hey, look, I know that I've got a regular coffee date with my sweetheart, and, and we're gonna meet on Fridays, and we're gonna have date night, uh, you know, once a month, or however that works out for you, right? This is how this starts to show up. Because understanding if your partner needs to be fed in her right side of her brain or in the left side of her brain, where is she dominant, where, is, where are you gonna be able to speak that language, is really important for you to understand how to fill her cup, right? So if, if we are looking at someone who's a right brain person, one of the things that we can do to help speak kind of their love language, so to speak, would be to do things on a regular basis in order to help fill them up on that side. That's why that consistency is important. That's why Hallmark exists, right? That's why you'll tend to find that it's usually the women who are buying the cards, setting those up to their friends, again, because of that connection, because they understand what that filling does for them. Meanwhile, we won't bring flowers when we screw up. And that, that usually makes her happy for a little bit, right? But then where does the happiness go when the flowers die? Bad move, guys, right? <laughs> what we should be doing instead, maybe, is on a regular basis make that part of just something that we do in order to help build up that brain. Now, if, you're, if your sweetheart happens to be a left brain person, maybe that works, right? Maybe that works really well for you, that you can do those one-off things and it's like, oh my gosh, flowers again? This is getting so annoying. I wish you would just stop this, right? That's something to be able to read in your partner. Being able to figure out who is who is gonna be a really interesting part of what we're gonna talk about at the end of tonight. Um, the other side here to this in times of time orientation, either future orientation on that right side or present time consciousness on this left side, has to do a lot with your outlook on life. So if you have, um, if you ask a room of people who identifies themselves as optimists, right, you usually get about half the room, you know, maybe two thirds, sometimes I've seen three quarters of the room, raise up their hand and say, yeah, we're optimists, because a lot of people like to identify themselves as optimists. Whenever I ask a room full of people who's a pessimist in the room, Usually I'll, I'll see maybe one or two hands show up. Usually most people don't want to identify themselves as a pessimist. But when I ask them who identifies themselves as a realist, that's when I see all their hands go up, right? Because that's how pessimists identify themselves. <laughs> pessimists don't identify themselves as pessimists. They say, I'm not, I'm not expecting bad things to happen. This is just reality. This is just how things are, okay? And so when you start seeing that, a lot of that has to do with their orientation towards time. So. Optimism comes from a positive future expectation. It says, things are going to work out. I have hope for that future because that's just kind of where my orientation for my brain lives. Whereas people who are realists, who live right here in the here and now, don't bother thinking about that because that future is always changeable. You don't really know what's gonna happen in there, so why bother you know, putting the thoughts there? Why spend the mental energy? And let's instead deal with what these things are right here and now. Um, the other part about this that has a lot to do with how your immune system works there is an actual correlation between how well the sides of your brain functions and your immune system. A lot of people don't understand that. They don't realize that the reason that they get sick a lot might have something to do with their brain and their brain health. There's actual uh, University of Virginia researchers a couple of years ago were the first ones to actually see that there are these little lymphatic vessels that live inside the brain. And the white blood cells that travel through there can talk back and forth with the neurons. They send chemical messengers back and forth and so we have this combination of a good, healthy brain leads to a good, healthy immune system. And sometimes what we have, instead of having an immune system that's, that's bad, we get sick all the time, we get an immune system that goes the opposite direction. 
it's hypervigilant. It's looking at all these things out in the environment as being threats. It's going, oh gosh, this natural stuff like this pollen or this food, this is, this is bad. This is going to be a foreign invader and i got to make a reaction to that. You also have the other way where some people's immune systems are reading their internal environment and they're looking at the health of the brain and they're going, hmm, I don't know, I'm kind of on a red alert. I don't see anything on the outside of the threat, but these funny looking proteins inside my body, I'm going to go after those. And that's what we call an autoimmune disorder. So as we're looking at this kind of converse, conversation between immune system health and brain health, understand just from a very basic standpoint, because there's a lot of people who like talking about this, that your, the health of your brain completely dictates the health of your immune system. The last piece in here about right side and left side that again has become very important for me as a chiropractor is understanding that the right side of your brain is really responsible for a lot of the muscles that come straight down your body in the central part of your body. So the ones that would control your posture along your back, those would be more right brain kinds of things. So you look at somebody who has tech neck, you know, they're sitting there on their devices all day and their head kicks forward. Sometimes the reason for that is actually because the right side of their brain isn't firing very well. It's kicking those muscles into high gear. The left side of your brain tends to work these arms and legs, what we call the appendicular skeleton. It's the part that helps you move side to side. It helps the right hand and left hand do some coordination stuff. That left side of your brain, if you happen to be a juggler, you know, probably left brain person, right? Really good at using those arms and legs. So um, as we're looking at those kinds of things, yeah, a juggler among other things, yes? Um, now, now what I want to talk about specifically is again, when we talk about the, the differences between male and female brains, getting back into how that starts to apply. So when we start talking about male brains, as I said before, more neurons in the male brain, but more connections in the female brain. And that has a really, really big implication for how we deal with stress. If, if anybody's ever heard of the, the neurological response to stress called the fight or flight response, what that is, is an activation of a portion of the automatic nervous system that we call the sympathetic nervous system. The places that that usually exits out of in your spine is actually from relays from the base of your neck down to just below where your ribs are. And the neurons that come out from there do really two important things for us. The first thing that it does is it shuts down the internal organs. The reason that's important is because if you're running from a pack of wolves, you don't really have time to digest your lunch. So it shunts information and blood flow away from those internal organs and goes out into your arms and legs. The second thing that's gonna do then is it's gonna increase tone for those arms and legs. So it gets your heart going, it gets your breathing going, it gets your blood pumping, all that in order to either defeat whatever the problem is or run away from it. Now, that is a very male way for dealing with stress. As we talked about fight or flight, this is part of where we start uncovering the patriarchy in neurology, is that we've termed it fight or flight forever. But female brains don't do that. They don't do that at all. They don't do fight or flight. They do something different because of the connections in here. I want you to think about whenever you're stressed, whether or not you, um, who cleans? Right? Yeah. So stress cleaning, yeah? That, that action is something that we like to call tend and befriend. If you think about calling, you know, calling your sisters, calling your friend, getting on Facebook and writing posts, right? That kind of wiring, the way that we, we relieve stress that way, actually has neurological bases. And if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, that makes a ton of sense. So if the guys are doing the fight or flight thing, they're out hunting, they're out gathering, whatever they're doing, right? We have the women together and all of a sudden a big threat comes in. It makes a lot of sense for them to circle the wagons, protect the kids, and their strength in numbers, their safety net, right? The other way that we like to think about it, again, this is called Mama's Chiropractic because they take care of a lot of pregnant women. One of the, the interesting phenomena that happens towards the end of pregnancy is something called nesting. Women find themselves, you know, just like vacuuming all the things. Oh, I think I'm gonna paint the baby room a different color today. Right? All those things that happen that, that, are, that are about creating this safe space in there is partially the sympathetic nervous system ramping itself up because it has a role to play in birth. Pretty cool. Um, the next thing in there, again, because of the biological differences, because the neurons are going out into the body for the males, one of the markers that we'll use to tell if a man is stressed is looking at his blood pressure. Now, the nerve system in that sympathetic state, like I said, it sends information out into the arms and legs. If it's increasing the tone of those muscles, then the amount of space 
the blood has to flow through those vessels gets decreased. That's going to increase the pressure. That's just basic physics. And so when we're looking at blood pressure for a guy, one of the things I think about is, hey, is he dealing with stress or not? Because if his blood pressure is high, independent of all these other markers, that's a pretty good indicator for me that he may not be dealing well with stress. Now, because the neurons stay within the brain for the female brain, I don't really pay as much attention to blood pressure if I'm looking for biological markers to determine whether or not a woman is stressed. What I look at instead is her heart rate and her respiratory rate, and here's why. So oxygen is important for life, yeah? Your neurons have to have oxygen, have to have glucose, they really like activity too, in order to stay good and healthy. The way that we circulate, the strategies of circulating that oxygen is through a couple ways. We can either speed up the pressure uh, coming through those blood vessels to shoot it faster up to the brain, so that's the male strategy for getting more oxygen up there. Or we can speed up the circulation within the system. Speeding up the circulation in that system is a function of heart rate. Now, heart rate physiologically is also married to your breathing rate. How many breaths do you take in a minute is tied in together with how fast your heart's beating. And if you're in a stressful environment, one of the best strategies that your brain has is to say, hey, listen, this might be a problem for the long haul. We might have damage to our bodies, we might have damage to our heads. What we need to do is be able to think clearly. So let's speed that up. And so as I'm looking at, for, for women, this, this, this difference between um, their sexes and telling whether or not she's stressed, I'm looking really closely at, well, what's her heart rate doing today? How quickly is she breathing? Because I want you to experiment with a couple things for me. I want you to just, for just for 10 breaths, I want you to take 10 really fast breaths. Go ahead and do that. Good. Now, if you think about anxiety, and you think about people with the vapor bag, and they're like, okay, now I need you to breathe really quickly into this thing, right? Those two things are related. If you are on a consistent basis, finding that, you're, that your heart rate is elevated, that you're breathing faster, we'll usually see that with an anxious state which is interesting to us because when we start looking after a baby's born at perinatal mood disorders, one of the things that we'll look for is to see, well, how quickly is she breathing? How well is she circulating oxygen? We actually use these little things that are called pulse oximeters to tell how much oxygen is flowing in the capillary beds of the, the fingernails so they can tell whether or not she's circulating oxygen well. There might be some other reasons, and this is important specifically for the female brain, that she's not circulating oxygen well. She may be anemic, she may not have uh, the, the, the whole complement of iron inside of her blood. Yep. Can some of these stressors also prevent pregnancy? Oh yeah, totally. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a whole other ball of wax we can get into. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. The um, uh, remind me about that because I'll talk about that when we get down to the end here. Um, the, the 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 interesting thing about being able to circulate oxygen, if we don't have those little iron carrying molecules that we call hemoglobin, we don't have enough of that iron because either through, through monthly blood loss for the female or postpartum after she's, after she's delivered a baby, right? Then she can kick that heart rate up, she can kick that respiratory rate up. She'll use these extra muscles in her neck, in her chest in order to breathe. And when we start looking at her from the side as those muscles get tighter and tighter and tighter as her head starts creeping forward and forward and forward. Now, one of the principles of chiropractic that we look at is this concept of subluxation. It's interference between how the brain and the body talk. And the further that you get away from that midline like this, the tighter those muscles get, and the more likely you are to blow a fuse, the more likely you're to get static in that channel so the brain doesn't talk well to the body. Well, imagine taking a safety pin, unclipping it so that we don't have the connection there. You have information coming from the body that's trying to get up to the brain, the brain's trying to get information back down the body, but that safety pin is unhinged, then it can't complete the loop, right? The chiropractic adjustment helps to complete that loop in there so that as the brain's trying to instruct the body and say, hey, listen, we need more oxygen, the body can relax and say, okay, well, this is how we should respond. These little position sensors here inside your ribs dictate to the brain how quickly you need to breathe based off of how well these guys move. So if these guys are getting fixed and locked, the brain thinks, oh man, we need to really speed that, that, that breathing rate up in order to pull in more oxygen. The interesting thing that happens if the frontal lobes, this part of your brain, isn't getting oxygen, is that it sends the brain into fight or flight, which continues this loop of increased heart rate, increased breathing rate, yeah? 
And so sometimes what happens too is the other thing these frontal lobes do is it also helps to relax what we call our flexor muscles. So your flexor muscles are like your biceps here, um, they're the hamstrings, the backside, they're these muscles in your neck that make your head come forward. If the frontal lobes aren't getting the oxygen, they can't stay healthy, not only are you going to fight or flight, you're also going into flexor tone. So forward comes that head. Now, there are some cases that I've had in this office, where we've seen women who have had this like nursing neck, their head's carrying way forward on them, and it wasn't because they were out of alignment. It wasn't because of subluxation at all. It was because they didn't have enough iron inside of their bodies in order to circulate the oxygen to refill the frontal lobes here, get them to relax. Once we got them to be able to do that, then down with their heart rate, down with their breathing rate, up with their posture, because their brains were then able to get the oxygen they needed in order to calm down the fight or flight system, in order to calm down the flexor tone, and that helped restore their level of health. Pretty interesting. That's one of the benefits of having a chiropractor who understands the neurological differences, what's a subluxation and what's not. It's part of the training. The next part in here, when we start talking about exercise, um, did you know that, it's, it's that like, there is an absolute reason for men to not do cardio? Which is great for a lot of guys who are like, oh man, I hate doing cardio. I just wanna go to the gym, I just wanna lift, man. I just wanna get my big muscles. I have friends like that. And, <laughs> and they hate the bike, and they, we, all have, we all have a friend, right? He just sits there, every day is like arm day, right? He's sitting there. And, yeah. Pops, yeah, here comes a selfie, right? Never does cardio. Well, there's actually, like, I, I'm gonna say, I, I stopped teaching people once I understood this a little bit better. When the brain is trying to send information out to the body about what is going on, and, and specifically in the male brain, it doesn't rely on oxygen carrying capacity in order to stay healthy. It relies on fast switch information. And so one of the ways that men can actually stay healthy is through strength training. It's not through endurance training. It's to be able to use that connection that they already have wired in between their brain and their muscles as quickly as possible. How quickly can you ask your brain to fire to send information on muscle? So it's one of the reasons I like things like, like CrossFit and powerlifting for guys is because it actually helps keep a healthier brain. Yeah. Could you get the benefits of both through sprinting? Yes. Well, sp sprinting is, a, sprinting is uh, well, I would, I, would, I would argue that the benefit that you can get through sprinting is going to be twofold, right? The first part of that is absolutely going to be a power activity. Sprinting is like, is part of the, so when we start, let's define that word power. So power is the ability to move an object through space in the shortest period of time as possible, okay? So whether that's doing a broad jump, whether that's doing, you know, low repetitions with heavy weight, or sprinting for a, for a short distance, right? I would, I would say that you could do that over a couple reps and that would give your brain a much better benefit than going that same distance at like a 70% heart rate, yeah? So cardio has a great benefit for women that it doesn't necessarily have for men. Again, it's about oxygen carrying capacity. We have these little things inside of our bodies called mitochondria. Now mitochondria are the powerhouses for our cells. The way they work is by taking um, oxygen through the, the, the circulating oxygen in the body and using uh, blood sugar to combine and break up the bonds and then it makes energy, okay? Um, we can continue to grow mitochondria inside of our cells the more that we ask it to do aerobic activity. The reason this becomes important for me as a chiropractor is I'm looking at endurance-based activities for the women in our office is because if they are able to grow their mitochondria, it gives me a metabolic equivalent. It gives me a kind of a way to approximate, well, how well is she carrying oxygen? How well does she metabolize that? How well does she utilize it? So I try to get more of the women involved in longer kind of like lower, medium heart rate, 70% maximum kind of, kind of heart rate activities, but doing it for a duration. If you think too about the brain side stuff, right? Right brain, left brain, one of the interesting things about the right side of your frontal lobes up here is they get hammered by stress. And I would argue that we've got a pretty stressful environment out there. Our culture is a pretty stressful kind of culture. And if we want to help build resilience inside the female brain, specifically for those right brain moms, one of the things that we can do is have them listen to affirmations maybe while they go for a 20 minute walk. 
So really simple thing that you can do in order to help build up that side of the brain. Get together in a group. Remember, it's about connection, right? Have a walking group of friends. What we're gonna talk about is positive kinds of things. When you do that, you start hitting that social connection piece, you start hitting that piece where we start talking about oxygenating the brain, uh, and you start doing that, that joy and contentment piece all in one little 20 minute activity. Um, last piece in here has to do with, with aging. Um, because there's more neurons that go out from the man's brain in the body, they have a tendency towards more motor neuron diseases. Connectivity diseases and autoimmune diseases are more found in female brains uh, because of the, the, the neurological differences between the two. You had mentioned earlier, Lawrence, about fertility. And this is a really big piece to the fertility protocol that we have in our office. So stress is the enemy of reproduction. It really is, for a lot of reasons. For one, stress uh, has with it a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol levels uh, inhibit the ability for sex hormones to, to, to work really well. Um, also, if this body is in a state of fight or flight or you know, tending to friends, right, the sympathetic response, then that changes what is a parasympathetic driven process of uh, egg release, sperm release, being able to create an embryo, to implant, and the growth and, and natural development of all the tissues that have to support that implanted embryo. And so one of the main things that we try to focus on in our practice is actually stress reduction. There's some things people can do supplementation wise. There's some stuff that we can do just by getting neurological clarity through chiropractic adjustments. But there's a huge piece in there that has to say, listen, reducing your stress levels makes you a healthier person. If we can start making healthier cells, we can certainly help with fertility. Um, I know a lot, there are a lot of protocols for even addressing people who are going through the process of cancer. And a big piece of that is teaching them stress management techniques because the internal environment that you create under a stressful condition has landed a lot of people in emergency rooms. Uh, National Institute of Health, uh, several years ago, actually had a, just a, a landmark study where they estimated between 75 and 90% of all ER visits can be traced back to stress. I mean, we're looking at heart disease, we're looking at, at diabetes, at insulin, pumping out from your body because it thinks it's under a level of stress. Uh, it thinks it's there's under threat and we're gonna have to tick the blood sugar um, a lot of people don't understand this about diabetes. The whole thing is about how do we utilize blood sugar? We're depositing it into the body. It's why we have an increased body mass with people who have diabetes. The whole idea behind that is sugar storage because the body thinks it's under threat. It thinks it's under assault and it may not ever eat again, so it needs to retain the calories and the nutrients in its way. Again, that has a ton to do with stress. So, yeah, I, I, would, say, I would say there are a whole host of things that people struggle with. Um, can be traced back into this this very simple thing. So the next piece that we're going to talk about really isn't necessarily well. How do we avoid that? It's how do we build resilience to it? Some of this happens even when we're little. Um, the uh, th there's a, a really interesting book that I read one time uh, about about where the origins of some of our fear responses come from, and they're different for boys versus little girls. Um, Part of that neurological difference within the brain is that the male brain is wired for scanning its environment. If you ever look at a brand new baby boy, uh, one of the things that they'll do is they're constantly looking around. They're looking around at their environment, they're looking at faces, and they'll look back over here. They're like, what is that kid looking at? Do I have like, do I have like angels on my shoulders? Do I have, are, are my dead relatives behind me somewhere, right? Or the, 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 yeah, there are these old souls floating around. Is it just, my kid loves looking at ceiling fans. What is it that they're looking at? They're not looking at me, right? Um, well, they're wired to be able to do that. It's an involuntary response. They're just scanning their environment because that's what their biology tells them to do. Little girls, on the other hand, will steal your soul through the eyes. Like they will just sit there and they'll lock in on you and they will just stare at you with these big old pools and it just lasts forever. Um, here is where this starts to, 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 to kick in for our primal fears, shame versus disconnection is basically this idea that we're doing it wrong. Um, we're super programmable in the first 12 months of life. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Super, super programmable so that when we're starting to, to just do our normal biological thing, how our parents respond to that has a lot to do with, for, for males, the, the shame response. If they're sitting there just scanning their environment, doing their thing, 
And mom is constantly like, nope, nope, look at me. Like, you're not taking a picture. Look at me and look over here. They get this message that they're doing it wrong. And so if they feel like they're doing it wrong, this isn't basis, then what ends up you know, happening in there is they stop trusting their, their biological drive. <laughs> Female brains, on the other hand, that connection, sitting there, staring at you, if you start breaking that connection on a regular basis, it's like, okay, I gotta go do my thing, right? I have to be very conscious of that as, as a, a healthcare provider who works with little baby girls all the time, that I'm sitting there working with them and they're just sitting there locked in on me, right? And I will not break eye contact until they break eye contact first. Because the disconnection response that a lot of women end up feeling later on, like you start talking about where relationships start breaking down, you start interviewing women about that, you find that one of the things that kickstarted this was them feeling disconnected in the relationship. You start asking men about what started happening, what started breaking down in the relationship. A lot of times that, that, old, that shame response, that old primal fear started coming back and suddenly, you know, I wasn't a good enough provider. I wasn't good enough in the bedroom. I wasn't good enough uh, to, to be able to, like I wasn't parenting correctly. I wasn't meeting her needs in, in a lot of these areas. And so this, 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 this shaming that starts to happen for guys becomes this internal just this ulcer that starts to eat them apart. And so a lot of couples end up getting driven apart in what could be very successful you know, relationships just because of how this stuff started getting wired in and we never figured it out. And so as parents, it's because it's an opportunity. There's a really unique opportunity to see our kids in a different light and start understanding that little boys are not little girls. Little girls are not little boys. And understanding that we have to address their brains differently is super important. Little boys don't mature their brains until far longer along the track uh, versus little girls. Little girls, usually their frontal lobes start firing up and they start being able to do things around five to six years old. Little boys don't begin that process of frontal lobe maturation until like somewhere around eight to 10 years. And so when you're looking at kindergartners and you have little girls who are just running mental circles around the boys and you're this, you know, you're the parent of a son who's having a hard time reading, having a hard time in math, right? And you're going, why can't you keep up with all these other people? That is the wrong approach for understanding how a little boy brain works. One of the most important things you can do for a little boy brain is appreciate the neurobiological difference. That their brains have all these neurons that are leaving their bodies and going out into the physical space. So one of the most important things that you can do for those little boys is sitting them in a classroom, is getting them outside, is getting them to climb trees, is getting them to dig in the dirt, is getting them to be physical and run into each other. You know, we have a tendency in, in our culture to, to, to use the, the two words that I try to erase from my vocabulary, which is, be careful, right? It's one of the worst things you can do to a little boy. Um, you can tell them sticks need space. My son has heard that a lot. Right? <laughs> Hand hold, foot hold, you know, right? <laughs> make, make sure, you know, to, to help coach them through the climbing, right? But those kinds of things. Sticks need space. Yeah, those kinds of ideas are really, really important for boys to be able to experiment and learn things with their bodies so they start wiring in their brains appropriately. Little girls, on the other hand, are happy and content to sit there with all their dolls and all their friends and have little tea parties. Because from that connection standpoint, they are doing a different thing. Dads, you have to play with your little girls in a different way than, than, than you would with the little boys. It's also to say, and again, this is not popular for a lot of people, but understanding that when we get into some maturation physically, sports, super, super important for those boys really important for them to do something a physical activity in order to help their brains continue to develop because those frontal lobes don't stop by the time we're 10. we don't stop until we're in the mid-20s really important for those males to stay physically active however those same physical activities things like gymnastics not super awesome at a high competitive level for little girls because what it's doing is encouraging a neurobiology of it going out into the physical body and continue to work those neurons, and instead what we ought to be doing is building more social connection, right? So understanding and appreciating that, even with like our teenage boys and teenage girls, the differences that they're trying to do is also super important. Get her into more endurance kinds of activities, right? Get her to power building activities. You know, those are really important for helping that neurobiology stay healthy. Um, 
next part in here, this is where all of this starts to come together for childhood. I mentioned earlier, from zero to 12 months, we have our biggest opportunity with our kids to help wire this stuff in. We have these things that are called brain waves. Everybody's familiar with the concept that, you know, every time that you have a thought or an emotion, what happens is these cells that sit inside your brain, they communicate with each other through this release internally of ions, of uh, calcium, potassium, and sodium. And, and what happens when they, when they change and move across the membranes is they release an electrical charge. These electrical charges can get picked up because they go from neuron to neuron. You start making these waves that you can pick up with electrodes. And there's different signatures for these different brain waves. The cool part about these different signatures is that when we pick them up, we can start identifying that subconscious thought typically happens when we consider this delta brain wave pattern. The alpha is where we consider creative uh, responses to be in. We really hope you can keep your kids in that from like the time they're three until the time they're 10 because it helps them think outside the box. Uh, we can get into states of alpha as adults during times of prayer and meditation, or they say that we have this golden hour right before we go to bed, and then also uh, right as soon as we wake up, we become very susceptible to affirmations. So again, remember what we talked about with right brain and building that up through daily affirmations and, and building up joy and contentment? The right side of your brain gets hammered by stress. It's a really good idea to engage in those kinds of activities on a regular basis for your own mental health. The beta brainwave is where most of us spend our time. It's in rational thought. It's not in looking at a broomstick and thinking it's a pony that you're gonna ride around the, the living room in. It's in, oh no, I know what we do with that broomstick, it's cleaning up your house, right? That's, that's where most of us live. Um, the reason this becomes important is because there's a, a theory out there that's gotten a lot of notoriety. I think it's one of the biggest advances in neuroscience that we've had. It's called polyvagal theory. I mentioned earlier this concept of the, the sympathetic nervous system. This portion of your automatic nervous system, your autonomic nervous system, that runs either the fight or flight response in males or the tend and befriend response in females. Well, there's a balancer to that we call the parasympathetic nervous system. It lives outside the sympathetics. I mentioned earlier the sympathetics come from about where your neck ends here to about where your rib ends. The parasympathetic, think of para like either the pair of them or outside of, sits at the top of the head here and then down here near the tailbone. And when those come out, they do the things that help run basically your organs, and they help push things out of your body. So you think of all the expression kinds of things that you do. An exhalation is a parasympathetically driven process. Sweating is, an, is, is a parasympathetically driven process. Um, orgasms and men, you know, menstruation and sneezing and all that kind of stuff, all parasympathetic. That's all parasympathetic driven process. Um, but there's one more piece to the nervous system that we, we just started talking about. It's this social aspect to our nervous system. So in addition to the autonomic drive of the physical body, we have a drive for our brain too. This drive, we call it polyvagal theory because the vagus nerve, this cranial nerve that leaves the brain in pairs and it wanders down through the whole body, it has an aspect to it that we're just beginning to appreciate. Here's the illustration I like to make. So if we had a baby, not really anybody here in the, in the, in the room or out there in the audience, crying, what, what's your instinct? To leave the baby, just walk away, or to pick it up? Pick it up. Yeah, pick it up, right? And, but here's the question is why. So if you're going to go pick up a baby, that's not your baby because it's crying. Most people say they want to do that because, you know, they just feel compelled to. They just like they want to get the baby feel better, right? It's just kind of what you do as a person. Well, if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, that, you know, here we have this, this crying baby and we're in a stressful, threat, threat, threatening environment, that baby's gonna give up your position. Yeah. It's gonna tell all the warring tribes and all the wolves, hey, listen, this is where all the people are hiding out, right? And so it doesn't really make sense for us, just from a logical standpoint, to just pick up some stranger baby that's just like, nah, right? But here's the reason why we do it. We suck from zero to 12 months at running away from danger. Babies are terrible at running away from danger. <laughs> They're so bad at it, right? Not all animals will do this, right? Little horses, they're born, they can pull, they can kind of like trot away from, you know, something trying to get them, yeah? But little human babies, terrible. They just lay there and cry, right? Honestly, knowing that early on when, when Lawrence was first born made me feel a lot better about picking him up mm -hmm. inside. Yeah. Because honestly, I was like, why is this? Why are you crying again? Yeah, why, why are you doing this again? I was doing it with my son. Right. Why? 
You're on me. It's time to go to bed. Why are you crying every single night? Because before, right? I was, like, you know, I, I read something somewhere that said, like, yeah, when baby cows are born, they're ready to just go. Yeah. Baby humans are not ready to go. Not like, so good, yeah. Like, if you were to, like, they really were meant to gestate probably for 18 months or 9 months or however long. It was a lot longer to be able to be on that fast track of exiting out the womb. Yeah, there's, there, there's, some, there, there's some things that go come along with being a two-legged being, right? Having an, up leg, uh, having an upright pelvis, uh -huh. yeah? Um, and so there's, there's this idea that uh, partially our brains are, are born immature, mm -hmm. and, and we see that. Like the frontal lobe really doesn't start kicking on for months and months and months, and then years and years and years, right? The brain doesn't start wiring well until after we've gotten through that phase. And so we have to use the only strategy we have, which is to be born cute. And you know, having yeah. just like folded up a bunch of baby clothes, uh -huh. reading all of the little things like mommy loves you. Yeah. Yeah, daddy's cutie, whatever. It's yeah. like, oh, you, the, your onesie is saying that, so I don't eat you. Yeah, so you don't, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so so you don't eat your child. That's a good point. Yeah, well, it's, it's also so you don't just leave them, right? Because here's here's something interesting about babies that are different than adults. So babies are have a face that's disproportionately misshapen in a really interesting way. Their head, their eyes are disproportionately large for the rest of their face. Yeah. Their nose and mouth are disproportionately small. Well, and they're anime sick. characters. They are. You know who else besides anime that figured this out? Walt Disney. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh -huh. There is something about that proportionality when we look at Mickey that says, oh, I like Mickey, right? Mickey's cute. Kids love Mickey, even though he doesn't really look like a mouse at all, right? All the Disney characters look kind of funny when you like the queen. Right, like right. giant all, eyes, giant eyes, just really yeah. tiny mouth. Right, mm -hmm. that is a strategy done by animators so that children mm -hmm. identify with those things and go, "Oh yeah, that's like me." And so when you're looking at when you're looking at this kind of thing, like this wiring together of of how our biology is wired in to take care of these little babies, this has everything to do with our polyvagal theory. This has everything to do with the social connection. And so if as a baby zero to 12 months, you cry and you say, hey mom, I've got a need, then you get wired into your adulthood programming. Oh, listen, I can communicate to the outside world in times of stress that I have a need and it gets met. The way this goes fast forward to being an adult is in times of stress, you're more resilient to it. You can negotiate your way through a problem. You can tell your partner, hey, listen, I really, really don't like the color of this room. And I know it's your favorite color, but can we compromise on this somehow? Like it allows you to, to say, <laughs> accent wall, right? Yeah, it, so, so it allows you to be able to negotiate your way through these kinds of things. Um, however, if you are that baby who's sitting there, and everybody's seen Hulk cry, like angry baby cry, right? You see the arms are held like this, red in the face. Remember what I said earlier about the sympathetic nerve system? And what it does with the brain here is it creates flexor tone it increases heart rate, it increases respiratory rate, it increases blood pressure. What you're seeing with the angry baby there is a sympathetic response. And if you are the fourth or fifth kid and you have to be the squeaky wheel in order to get mom's attention, and so you constantly find yourself having to go to that strategy in order to get picked up or fed or put to bed or get your, your diaper changed, whatever it is, you get hardwired in from a Delta programming standpoint that I've got a tough environment. I have to, as a male, fight or flight. I have to, as a female, tend to befriend, because I got kind of a dangerous environment, I need to be able to manage it that way, right? The third strategy that you have, as a baby who sucks at running away from danger, is to go parasympathetic. Now, I love Jurassic Park. My son and I, we play Jurassic World all the time. Um, most people out in public think that my name is Owen, and that his name is Blue, because that is what we do constantly when we're out. He always refers to me as Owen. If I'm going to tell people my name, they're going to be like, you're a liar, your name's Owen. Um, and I don't know why you call your son Blue, but that's what you do. So we do this constantly, right? One of the things I love about it is what you do in times of, in case a T-Rex ends up coming through the door, right? So if a T-Rex is going to come through the door right out there, there are two options for you. You can either run away from it, or you can pretend like you're dead. Yeah? Now, the smart strategy when the danger is too big is to play really, really small, 
is pretend you're dead. You can't, if you don't move, the T-Rex can't see you. He walks on by, he goes after the fresh ones that are running away, right? They taste better. I've been laying here for a long time. I taste gross inside, right? All of that strategy that we have is the same thing here in Florida that little lizards do when you startle them, right? At first, they don't run away. They go, you can't see me. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can. And then they run away. And so that idea, that parasympathetic response, is the oldest response to stress. Now, if that is your strategy that you have to employ regularly, this is why I hate crying it out. This is the strategy that you have to employ regularly. Remember what I said about what the parasympathetic system does. The parasympathetic system runs your internal organs. And if you start breaking down in parasympathetics and you start draining that bucket, the next thing to go are your vital organs. Remember what we talked about with stress? And is stress related to any of these like conditions of health? Absolutely are. That if we don't have resilience, social, sympathetic, parasympathetic to the stressors that we have in our environment, we go through this train of, oh, I can negotiate my way through it. Nope, I got to fight or flight. Nope, that's not working either. And then the next thing you know is that you're on, you know, on that in the ER at the cardiac surgeons, right? He's cutting you open and stitching you up. The idea about this came from the Institute of Heart Math, who studied Fortune 500 executives who were having repeat heart attacks. They had the best access money could buy to cardiac rehab guys and to cardiac surgeons, and they kept on, you know, going through this process of all right, I get stitched up, I go back and work those sympathetics, get those arms and legs going, and then boom, stress, another heart attack. And the only way that you were able to break this cycle was by able to say, hey, listen, we need to get you in community. We need to get you talking about your problems, either do some charity work or be anonymous and start talking about these kinds of things somehow, right? That's what helped them break the cycle. They helped them refill the bucket of that social Vegas. The way we do that here in our office is multiple. Uh, we have a community group, Pathways Connect Southwest Florida, you know, that we do, and it's purpose behind that group, is that the reason that we do these things and gather together with our friends is to help build our resilience to stress. How can we tell who is who? This is the important piece about chiropractic care. So we can tell who's stressed out and who has a right brain or a left brain issue by how they stand. Chiropractors are always looking at people. If you know you ever meet a chiropractor, within the first 10 seconds, trust me, they know more about your brain than, than probably most people on the planet are gonna know about you. Because they just look at your posture and they can tell all kinds of things about how well you're communicating on your insides. When we start looking at people and they have that head that's carrying forward like this, the first thing I think about is about those frontal lobes up here and whether or not they're firing well. If they're not firing well, it tells me that flexor tone is kicking up. It also probably tells me they're under stress, or their sympathetic nervous system is probably on overactive drive. The other thing that I look at is to see what side of their brain is firing well, because remember what I said about those frontal lobes also do flexor tone. This is a really interesting thing to do with somebody sometimes. Have them close their eyes, have them nod their head forward and back while they're standing. Let's do it three times. Just turn their head one side or the other. And then while they're standing there with their eyes closed, take a picture of them. What I want you to do is then show them, take a look with them, does their head tilt off more to one side or the other? Is their shoulder up higher on one side or the other? Does their arms, where it meets their body, flare out one side or the other? Does their toes toe out to one side or the other? All of those are the flexors in the body. If you have a predominance of flexor tone more on one side than the other, what that's telling us is one of two things. The first thing that's telling me is maybe that side isn't firing good enough. Those frontal lobes aren't firing well, and that's why those muscles are getting tight involuntarily. Think about a baby in fetal position, right? I said those frontal lobes haven't developed yet. The main job for those frontal lobes is to get us to be an upright being by 12 months. We don't stay that way. We get physical stresses, we get mental, emotional stresses, we have chemical stresses, garbage inside of our bodies, and that starts blowing fuses left and right. Suddenly, the next thing we know, we're like bent over like this. The other thing that can potentially tell you is maybe if somebody's pretty healthy, they have good, they have good coordination, you know, their, their heart rate's really good, their respiratory rate's really good, their blood pressure's really good, but they still have a bit of a head tilt, is it might tell you that the high side up there is the side where they're really dominant. You'll find a lot of professional athletes have a tendency to have a right head tilt, not because they have a problem with their frontal lobes up here from stress, because their left side of their brain is so strong. 
They're very present, they're very driven. They're the ones that are the gym rats, they're in there shooting, you know, 100 free throws before they go, before they end practice, right? There is something about their brains that allows them to do that extra work. And it's not because of a deficit on one side, but because they're super driven on, on, on the other side. So getting them to balance out their brains, we're feeding, feeding their brains, understanding the right and left side, understanding male versus female is super important to help keep them healthy long-term. The last thing that we check is again the vitals. We talked about this earlier. I love to see, okay, how well are you circulating oxygen? That's the whole name of the game for how to keep a healthy brain, is how well do you circulate oxygen? For men, what's that looking like in terms of blood pressure? I will find blood pressure uneven, right side and left side, because we've got frontal lobes that aren't working great and on the right side, and so suddenly that right side's tighter, so guess what happens to blood pressure on the right side? Boop, up it goes. But on the left side, it's looking normal. We're like 140 over 90 on the right side, 120 over 80 on the left side. I don't just go, oh, well, this side was good. No, what I say is, well, good. Your heart appears to be working fine. What's happening is we're getting an increase in tone on this side that's related to your brain. You need to feed your brain better information. The way that we feed brains better information is twofold as chiropractors. One is chiropractic adjustments, removing subluxations, help send good information up into the brain about where the body parts are. The second thing that it does in order to help preserve neurological clarity is that we can target specific adjustments based off of if we need to feed the right side of the brain or if we need to feed the left side of the brain. What we can do is, it's a really cool trick, 85% of the ability for me to use this side of my body, right, the right side of my body, is coming from the left side of my brain. So what I'll do as a chiropractor is I'll target specific adjustments or, or send sensory signals up that right side of the body in order to feed this left side of the brain. So chiropractors who work a lot in functional neurology, and we're applying this to pregnancy, or applying it to pediatrics, we're applying it to family chiropractic care. One of the reasons I started doing this is because I mentioned at the end of that, uh, that, that sex difference in the brains, motor neuron diseases, uh, connectivity diseases, things like Alzheimer's, things like Parkinson's. There's a, there's a scientist by the name of Daniel Amen who's been doing brain imaging, looking at glucose uptake in the brain. And what he started discovering is that Early dementia, early onset of, of brain problems can be caught when people are in their 40s. I started my practice here in Cape Coral eight years ago. Those parents, if they started off maybe like when they were in their early or the mid 30s when they started bringing their kids in, are now in this age range. And I saw this coming down the track that I plan on being in Southwest Florida for the rest of my, you know, the rest of my career. And so I knew that my friends here if I could pay closer attention to how their brains were working, then maybe I could help change with the pattern of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's that we're seeing going up and up and up and up again. By taking really, really good care of their brains and specific chiropractic care, and maybe what I could do is stimulate those parts of the brains, help educate them about this stuff, to, how they can help support their partners, help, how they can help grow healthy brains, because in my family, we got a really, really big, strong, Spectrum of Alzheimer's. So my step, uh, my, my, my step grandmother, uh, she passed away from it. My uh, my middle name namesake, uh, my the grandpa Bill, he had Alzheimer's. Um, watching them degrade and go downhill, and there wasn't anything they could do about it, was one of the most helpless feelings uh, as as a, as a as a doctor I've ever had. Right? What do you do once the brain's already decayed? Right? There's, there's, they're trying to come up with genetic, you know, answers. They're trying to come up with different prescriptions. Everybody will tell you that the, the best solution is this prevention. And so as parents and as people are getting stressed in our cultures, that's what I encourage people to do. So lutogenically, the, the way that we can build health is for better clarity, better understanding of our own brains, better understanding of our own nervous systems, and how we help our own bodies. How, importantly, how we help our parents, how we help our, our partners, and how we help our kids too. Um, if you have any questions about what we talked about tonight, uh, again, this is, this is what we're trying to do, is, is feed that brain together. Um, one of the ways that, that we do it here at Mama's Chiropractic is the chiropractic care. Eyes off. I know, right? Disney, this is, this is why I put it up there, right? Because you're cute. Yeah. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to leave you with a couple tips uh, that, that I was promising some people earlier. Um, as I mentioned, building joy and contentment is one of the most important things that we can do for our partners, uh, both, both male and female, to, to help them stay resilient to stress. Guys do not remember things 
for a very specific reason now that you understand connection inside the brain. We don't make the same neurological connections and associations that women do. And so one of the ways that you can help us when we're trying, when you're trying to remind us to do things is to appreciate that biologically we have differences and we need to be reminded three times. And this is a foolproof rule for if you have something they want your, your, your male partner to, to do, to be able to, to, to tell him first, right? So let him know this is something I need you to do. The second thing that you need to do is to create a, a some kind of physical reminder for that. Whether that's like a, a note, uh, you can like make a checklist, um, any, anything that he can physically, tangibly have in his hands to be able to look at. And the third is a reminder note, usually when he's gonna be at the place. So send him a text, right? <laughs> because we get in our physical bodies as we're looking around for things, we're not necessarily remembering all these things up here to remember to put forward out of our pocket. So this, this three-step way to help your male partners remember things, you'll be much happier with the results you get, I promise you about that. And if they call it nagging, come talk to Doc. Yeah, and if they call it nagging, call, come talk to me, right? Use your, like, everybody has a visual assistant. Yep. Use it. Use it, totally. Like, like if you use your Google Assistant, mm -hmm. then you <laughs> want him to go to the store and set up uh, like a shopping list. When he's at the store, guess what the phone will do? Did you get this? Yep. Do it automatically. You don't have to do it three times. You just have to do it once, right? Yeah, you can do it once, right? <laughs> hey, I set something up in your Google Assistant to make sure you get, you know, milk, eggs, and bread, mm -hmm. and then it shows up. Oh, milk, eggs, and bread. Oh, there you go. And then you're, you, 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 get, you, you do it. Yeah. I mean, Siri does it too. Like, yeah. They, like they all AI. Do. It's an ad for AI, right? right? But this is one of the ways that it's helping us, you know, stay together longer. Um, remind me, right? <laughs> Whatever that ad campaign is that you did again. Um, the type of exercise that you do, as I, as I said, it matters. So, as males, I would encourage my long distance runner friends not to like at me about how wrong I am about this. But, um, you know, do some power work. It's really important. Do some sprints, that kind of stuff. Come play really, soccer. Yeah, come play soccer. Yeah, people, people, people need you. Um, but it helps, it helps from a biological perspective. It's why I exercise the way that I do is because it helps my brain. Um, if, you know, my, my female friends that are in CrossFit who can, who can squat way more than I can, again, don't at me about this, right? She what should I, play what soccer too. Do, she you should, should play soccer too. And you should continue to run the entire time. Right? That's the idea is that, is that you do the whole thing. You're a midfielder, right? Yeah. Um, but, but, but again, as we start looking at reasons why we're running into things like fertility issues, polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, these issues with, with menstrual cycles, a lot of it has to do with what kind of neurological signaling are we doing internally. And so the type of exercise that you do definitely matters. Last piece in here, seriously, have a lot of sex. You gotta have a lot of sex. The neurological research on this for longevity suggest that people who are living really well into their 70s and 80s have physical intimacy at a level of somewhere between three or four times weekly. Now for a lot of people, they're like, whoa, what? Because I was married and that was not the case for me. And now that I'm single, I'll tell you, again, not the case for me. So <laughs> I'm really, really worried about my brain health. Uh, <laughs> it's for my brain health. 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 <laughs> Doing it, doing it on your own doesn't count. <laughs> it is not the same. This is sexy brains. We knew we were going to talk about sex at some point in time. Uh, <laughs> I'm losing my audience. Uh, but but seriously, the, the, the longevity, there's a, there's a study, um, I believe it's been, it's either Harvard or Yale, has been doing this really long-term study looking for generations of people. And they're tracking things like relationships that they have. They say that if you have between, like people who are living well for the longest, have between five to seven good intimate relationships, like people they can call on. The way they find that is, can we call somebody at three o'clock in the morning and come over to your house and, and talk with you, right? Like those kinds of long-standing relationships are super important. But also physical intimacy with a partner matters. It's that connection, it's that, that social vagus that we're building together. It's the ability to work through problems. It's the ability to, um, to, to have that energetic exchange that's, that's natural for our bodies to physiologically do through our lifetime. And so, um, as we're talking about ways that we can feed our brains, if you're not getting it that, that regularly, maybe you go back to the beginning of the video and start understanding how to better communicate with your partner <laughs> about, your, about your needs. So, um, yeah.
Uh, Miles Chiropractic, that's the name of our practice. Uh, my name is Doc Edwards. Um, a lot of this information, again, not only do I do I get the opportunity to lecture around the world, but we have a book that's gonna be coming out called uh, One Belly, Two Brains. And a lot of this kind of information that, that I share within my practice, I put into this book too, so that parents can help understand this as well. So that you can understand not only how to work best within yourself, but also how to help, help your children in the first year of life. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Follow us on Facebook, Miles Chiropractic. Um, we do our One Belly Wednesdays on there. We do them here on the YouTube channel. Um, if you are local to Southwest Florida, you're interested in conscious parenting and natural lifestyle choices, I highly encourage you to check out Pathways Connect SWFL. That's our, it's our, our, our private Facebook group where we're gonna talk about a lot of these kinds of things too. So thank you guys very much. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Uh, go and click the buttons to do all that kind of stuff. We're gonna be doing these kind of videos on a regular basis. I do adult education events every single month. We have family events where we get together every single month. And I also do uh, these kinds of talks on a weekly basis. So I look forward to seeing you and uh, send me questions in the comments.